All right, everybody, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Mike's not on? All right, you guys, let's open up in prayer. And then we will uh, we'll start our study. All right, you guys ready? On your marks, get set. <laughs> All right, you guys, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship that we have here, Lord. We're thankful for your love, Lord. And Lord, we have a couple of requests to lift before you, Lord, as Brother Todd Collins is going in for knee surgery this morning. We pray that your hand would be upon him, Lord, and that you would bring quick healing to him. Lord, we're thankful that Eric is back with us, Lord. After battling uh, sickness, Lord, he's back with us. And, and Lord, we lift up uh, the many things. One brother asked me to pray for the Dodgers, and, but Lord, I think they're beyond prayer at this point. <laughs> So, Lord, we just thank you for this time that we're able to open your word and study. Lord, we just thank you again for this time. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as mentioned, uh, let's keep Brother Todd Collins in prayer. He's going in for knee surgery. I think he's already there at 515. So, uh, God bless you, Manny, for logging on and watching. Uh, today, we're in 1 Kings chapter 15. And we're going to do a little something different today. I'm going to, we're going to look at a couple of verses here. And then I'm going to take you to another book of the Bible, the Book of Mormon. So if you got uh, Also, just to give you a heads up, uh, we're having technical difficulties with our, with our screen. So you may not get the reference verses. I'll say them slowly so if you guys are writing them down. But you know, men, it's not how we start. It's how we finish, right? We can apply that in many things of our lives today. We can, we think about that in our relationship with our wives, with our kids, in our marriages, at work. But primarily we think of this in our Christian walk with the Lord. There's times in my life, men, where I've started the race quickly and I petered out. And it wasn't how I started because a lot of time, a lot of us can start with a bang. But then there can be a tendency to fizzle out when the race gets tough. And I think a lot of us men have fallen victim to times like that. Where it's all about Jesus, it's all about this and it's all about that. And give ourselves three to six months and it's the same old, same old. What happened? Why do we start so well and not finish well? I like what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run the race with endurance that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who, for, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, as he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, you guys, since I can't run track, as you can tell how great in shape I am, round shape, I'll watch it. Because what I can't do, I love watching other people do. And uh, I was flipping through the channels the other day, and I came across this track meet. And I think of Brother Mike who ran track. Connie ran track. I mean, have you seen those people running? They fly, man. I mean, those they, they can fly. But I was watching uh, uh, the men. They, they had to run a, around the track like four times. And, uh, and there was one that had to do it like 15 times. And I was watching them. And I noticed that they all, some of them, when they run, they're, they're blocked. Some of them are way in the back. And when they start, it looks like that's, it's unfair because there's a group of people that are a length ahead. And they begin and they shoot the gun and, and they run. I think a lot of us, if they shoot the gun, we'd all hit the floor, right? <laughs> but they shoot the gun and they're trained to run. 
and they start to run. And I start to think about the people in the back. And everybody else is ahead of them. And a lot of them start out really fast. But you get to the sixth, seventh, eighth lap, and you see these guys that have been in the front from the beginning, started off with the bang. Little by little, they're starting to fall back. And little by little, the ones who started at the back, who have paced themselves and who have endured the race, now start to gain ground. Some of them started off really fast, and, but the one who stayed consistent and paced themselves was the one that was able to at least not win, but place. You see them gradually as they move up closer and closer. The guy that was all the way in the back surprisingly now takes the lead and, and as he paces himself, he finally, the one who started off last, finished first. Have we ever been there? The last one to possibly find a job? The last one to get married? The last one to get a car? The last one to start a family? And it, sometimes it can seem like everybody else is winning but us. But regardless of what our position is, God has purposely placed us in a position in the path of our life. We're not to worry about what our buddies and brothers and friends are doing. We're to concentrate on the path that God has given us. It doesn't matter how you start, it's how you finish. And according to Hebrews, as we looked at chapter 1, that we should race the race that is set before us with endurance. Like this runner, we will have to pace ourselves and we don't have to run in such a rush. Sometimes I think that in our Christian walks that we have to rush through things. When God is saying, no, this is a race of endurance. Yes, people will pass us up in their lives. We see it all around. I remember when I first uh, knew I was called to ministry, I seen all these people being used, you know, Bobby who goes to the Bible college, he, he probably knows this. When you're at the Bible college, you start seeing all these people being used before you and you're thinking, Lord, what about me? When are you going to use me? Everybody else is being called to church, plant a church. Everybody else is, is, they're teaching Bible studies and here I am faithful to your word. You know what? We're not to worry about what other people do. So yes, we're to endure this path. But remember, men, it's not where we start, it's how we finish. And we can apply this to our Christian walks this morning. We often think that this race that we're racing, enduring is a sprint. But it's not. Because when there is a tendency to sprint, there's a tendency to peter out. And you know, men, we know this. There's brothers here that are usually here in the morning. Where they've been the last six months? What happened in their race? They started well. We start well. But men, it's not how we start. It's how we finish. And in today's passage, we're going to put our eyes on King Asa, who started well. Matter of fact, when we look at 1 Kings chapter 15 up to from 11, 9 to 24, we would say this guy was a great king. But it doesn't matter how we start, men. It's how we finish. And in today's passage, we'll see that this man, Asa, is the son of Abijam. Abijam was the king of Judah. He was the son of Rehoboam. And he was the one that said that walked in all the sins of his father. Remember last week? Abijam. Almost sounds like Abijah, Yah, God. But the writer, because of him falling into all the sin, took that honor away from his name. And his name now, Abijam, means the man of the sea versus the man of God. And it was Abijam who was ruling over Judah, who, according to verse 3, walked in all the sins of his father. 
So now we pick up in uh, 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 9, and look what it says here. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacah, the granddaughter of Absalom. In 11, verse 11, remember, it's not how you start. It's how we finish. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father, David. And he banished the perverted persons from the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Also, he removed Maacah, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook of Kidron. But... The high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. Verse 15, he also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated, the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. Now there was war between Asa, Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. And Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not let, excuse me, that he might let no one go out or come into Asa's king, Asa king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king of the king's house, and he delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tab uh, Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, let, us be, let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was a treaty between my father and your father. See, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. Come and break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will draw away from me, or he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Adad heeded king Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel's and he attacked Ijon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Makkah, and Chinaroth with all the land of Naphtali. Now it all happened when Basha heard of it, that he stopped building Ramah and remained in Tizra. Then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah, none was exempted. And they took away the stones and timber of Ramah, which Baasha used for the building. And with them, King Asa built Giba, Benjamin, and Mizpah. The rest of the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did in the cities which he built are not they written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. So Asa rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. So when we initially look at this, we say, wow, Asa, you've done a great job. You started well. You did lots of reform, and you were a great king. But there's a lot of things here missing that our writer does not, for some reason, does not list. Well, of course, when you look at verses 9 and 10, as we learned last week, we now will always learn of a chronological fact. The writer will always use the other king's reign time versus the king that's being introduced. Matter of fact, it says here in the 20th year, uh, the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel. So whenever the writer now begins to introduce a king, he will always use the backdrop of the king that is in the north. And Jeroboam had been reigning 20 years. And it was toward the end of Jeroboam's reign that we see that Asa now comes into the picture. We hear about Asa, he has reigned 41 years. That's a long time. It says that here, it says that his grandmother was Ma'aka. Again, a reference to 
a female, the mom, that is part who has influence in their lives. We will notice in Kings from this point on that whenever there is a reference to a new king, he will always be used to measure against the ruling king in the north and the mother or grandmother will be mentioned. And then after that, they will give a commentary whether he did evil or he did good in the eyes of the Lord. And so this is what we see here as a basic formula that the writer is using in Old Testament writing. So we see that he has reigned 41 years and that the, the, the grandmother is named Ma'aka. The mention of his mom is not mentioned because they don't know if she had died and that he had been raised by the grandmother. This grandmother had influence in, Jerob, uh, in uh, uh, Abijam's reign because she is the one that made the perverted images of an idol for them to worship. They were very obscene idols. They were idols that were showing sexual acts, idols that were showing different things that were considered perverted. And it says here later that he cut them down. The influence that Abijam's mom, Ma'aka, who is now the grandmother of Asa, it says some commentaries understand that Abijam's wickedness, Abijam was the previous king, had included incestuous relationships with his mother and potentially where Asa came from. It's not, that was just what some commentators were saying. I have a tendency not to believe that, but that was what something I came across. But less alarming than that, we see that Asa, in verse 11, did was right in the eyes of the Lord as did his father, David. It's referencing his grandfather. So some people are saying that Asa's mom died and that his grandmother, Ma'aka, continued the role of the queen mother that she had occupied. Remember, Abijam only reigned three years. If, there, if, if it was true that this relationship was inappropriate, we know that the writer would be very good in pointing that out. But we see here in verse 11 that Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This is kind of refreshing because the last three kings we've looked at, they all have done evil in the sight of the Lord. They have all done wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And now here we kind of get this refreshment of this king now doing good in the eyes of the Lord. And I thought that was interesting because that tells us that the eyes of the Lord are always watching us. The eyes of the Lord are always, and the Bible tells us, looks to and from in the earth looking for a heart that is faithful. And I think sometimes we think that, well, God won't see me in the dark. God won't see me in the, in the closet. God won't see me here. The eyes of the Lord are always are always in our lives. And if we were to do an introduction into a book of your life, what would the introduction be? Would it be Jeff Hatfield did right in the eyes of the Lord? Now, if I asked Tim Velarde, I don't know. <laughs> Telling us that God's eyes are always on us. I used to think, guys, that if I went in the room and it was dark and nobody seen me, I was good, right? I can get away with anything. But God's eyes are always on us. And we're either doing evil in the sight of the Lord or we're doing good. There's no middle ground. There's like, I'm doing okay. No. We're either doing good in the eyes of the Lord or we're not. We can't fool ourselves to think that, uh, I'm in that halfway ground. No. 
What are our lives reflecting today, men? Asa, we're not told directly what motivated him to do these things or what caused him to be to do what was right in the Lord. We know back in verse 4 that, that the prophet uh, promised that there would be a lamp in Jerusalem. Here is the lamp that is being referenced. Maybe Asa somehow heard about David's deathbed charge to Solomon, where it says in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 18 through 20, and, shall, and also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in the book from the one, the priest and the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord and his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up, his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in the kingdom, he and his children's in the midst of Israel. So we see that Asa is doing good things. Look what he does in verse 12. He banishes the perverted persons. These perverted persons were temple prostitutes where they would go into the temple and perform heinous and horrible sexual acts in the temple of God. But you're thinking, John, that sounds so horrible. Are we not also considered the temple of God? He banished perverted persons from the land and removed all their idols that his father has made. In verse 13, it says, he removed Ma'aka. He's like, Ma'aka, get out of here. She was the one that was behind all of this. See, in verse 13, it says, and he removed Ma'aka, grandmother, from being queen mother because she made an, an obscene image of Asherah. You see what he's doing? He's getting the perversion out. What's interesting about this, guys? That when we begin to lift our hearts up to other things, eventually our hearts will turn to the perverted things. Just give it some time. And our hearts will automatically go into the perverted thinking, the perverted acts, the perverted way of doing things, and right away, he removes the sexual perversion. He removes the, the perverted persons. He removes Ma'aka, the grandmother queen, or, as she made obscene images for the people to worship. And he cut down, in verse 13, her obscene image, and he burned it by the brook of Kidron. In verse 14... We get the but. What happened? But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. When you look at this in the original language, it, it, there seems that the writer is using a very careful choice of words here because we can easily blame Asa for this. Another translation can say, but the high places did not stop. It's possible that these high places were thought to be places worship the Lord and maybe they weren't as offensive as we see that has been pointed out here. But for whatever reasons, under Asa, these unacceptable institutions still remained. My question is, why did he not get them all? And I started thinking about my own life. There's times in my own life that I will remove everything, Lord, I give you everything. But this right here, God, I'm going to hang on to because that's my secret sin. That's the sin I like to do, Lord, when I'm just going to tuck it away in my pocket. And, and in a case of an emergency, I'm going to pull it out and use it because I deserve it. I used to think that way. I used to think that I can just do, live for God the certain way and then I can excuse myself 
in that little thing, which is not little, because that little thing will grow and will grow and regrow. And, you know, just being transparent with you guys. The times I would go and I would be walking with the Lord for many years and then, you know what, I've been doing good. And I would go through my phone and I would find and see an old phone number there and I was like, oh man, that's the, that's the connect right there. And I was like, oh man, I wonder if it's their number. Call them, hey, what's up? Is this so-and-so? Hey, what's up, bro? Hey, just wondering how you're doing. So what you been up to? I've been going to church. Oh, you go to church, yeah. Hey, why don't you swing on over? I have something for you. Boom, I'm gone. I'm just gonna go witness to them. You know how, we know how that works, right? They offer me a beer. I drink a beer. Oh, this is cool. Drink another one. Oh, I'm feeling good. Then they offer me something. Then I'm off and running. Next thing I know, I'm in jail. All over again. Because I didn't remove those high places in my heart. I didn't remove those things that had potential for me to go down that path. I, for whatever reason, Asa did not remove those remaining high places. Is it possible or is it possible that he wasn't thorough in removing these and maybe kept them there for a rainy day? Because that's what I used to do. I used to keep things on the side for a rainy day. When I got in a fight with my girlfriend, gave me an excuse. Then later on, I kept wanting to fight, so it just gave me an excuse. Or I worked hard and I deserve it. I maintained and allowed those high places in my heart not to be removed. And the writer here says, Asa has done all these great things, but the high places still remained. Yet, he is still faithful to the Lord. Can we still have those high places in our hearts, men, and be totally faithful and loyal to the Lord? We can think so. We can think that we can. I told you guys this story many times. Where one night I was, I was, I just graduated from the men's home. I've been there a year. I go to the men's home and, and uh, all I did was men's home. And then I got a job. I'd come back to the men's home. And man, I wanted to get out and experience things. I started working and the people I was working with, they had a party. Man, I haven't been in a party in years. So I go there and I get offered a drink, a beer, and I drink it. Next thing I knew, I'm making a fool out of myself. Well, the next morning, I went with the pastor of the small church I was going, and we went door to door, knocking on people's door, inviting them to church. I was hungover. My breath was kicking. I had a headache. It was hot. I was, you guys know, I think. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm sure you guys don't know. I'm talking to a bunch of perfected saints here. <laughs> and I'm trying to stay as far away as I can from the pastor because all he had to do is get close to me and I would smell like Miller Brewing. And I remember going to this door and I'm, I'm, I'm with the pastor and inside I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm hungover. But I got to play it off because I'm the one that carries the biggest Bible at the church. I'm the one that has the biggest smile and God bless you. And, but I was living like this double agent life. And so I'm going and knocking on the door. And, and it's one of those screen doors where you can see in. Or you can't see in, but they can see out. And I knock. And they're like, hey, how can we help you? And my name is John and we're at this church here. And I'm here with Pastor So-and-So. And we just want to invite you to our Easter Sunday service. I try to muster up as much smiling as I can. And I hear in the background, Mom, who is it? And I hear footsteps. And she said, oh, it's you. I was like, they got me mistaken for somebody. You were the one that was a drunken fool last night at the party. Who made a fool out of yourself? Who did this and did that and did that? And I'm thinking, no, you, guys, you got me wrong. I mean, there's a bunch of people that look like me. You guys got it wrong, man. That, it's not me. And she said, if you are what a Christian is, I want nothing to do with Christianity. 
We know that God's Holy Spirit can break any hardened heart, but I wonder, I always wondered, because of me, does she walk away from the Lord? She will always have that bad taste in her mouth because I continued to have those high places in my heart and I gave into it. Men, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. And we see that he did great things. He cut down the high places. He, he removed the asterisk. He got Ma'aka out of there. He burned the image. He tore down the idols. He banished the perverted persons. He started well. He started well. But there's a turning point here, man. Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. It's a little bit to your right. I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to give you guys a quiz. Remember, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. Anybody can start a race. Anybody can go off and, and make it look good. But it's how you finish. It's what counts, men. Look what happens here. Uh, Second Chronicles, uh, actually chapter 14. I'm just going to do some highlights with chapter 14, and then I'll, I want to read something in 16. When you look at chapter 14, when you look at, uh, at the end of verse 1, it says, And in his days the land was quiet for 10 years. There was no war. We're talking about Asa. And verse 2, it says, And he did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Again, he started off right. We know this from our previous chapter in, four, in, uh, in verse 15. He removed the altars of the foreign gods. In verse 3, he, he took down the high places, broke down the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden image. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord. Wow, this guy is amazing. In verse 4, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord. Verse 5, he also removed the high places. And in verse 6, he built fortified cities for Judah. Because the Lord had given him rest. In verse 9, we see in chapter 14 of 2 Chronicles, there is an army of one million people that come against them from Ethiopia. And they're coming against Asa after this 10-year period has been up. And it says there are a million men and 300 chariots came to Maresha in the valley of Zarephath. In verse 11, And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, nothing for you to help. It is nothing for you to help, whether many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you. Wow, he cried out to the Lord. We will go out against this multitude, O Lord, your God, and do not let men prevail against you. Verse 12. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah. He started out well. In verse 15 of chapter 2, he says, The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. You. In verse 7 of chapter 15, but you be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words from the prophet of Obed, the prophet, he took courage, courage, he removed the abominable idols from the land of Judah and in Benjamin, from all the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim, and restored the altar of the Lord that was in the vestibule of the Lord. Verse 12, then they entered a covenant to seek the Lord a God of their fathers with all their heart and all their soul. Verse 13, and whoever did not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be put to death. Man, this guy started out great. Verse 15, and all of Judah, what? Rejoiced. A man of God that has now taken the kingdom and where it's supposed to go. Men who are fathers, this is so important because God has entrusted us with a family, with a wife, and with children, and they are taking your lead. And when we see that, that, that Asa was doing all these things, it says the people rejoiced. They followed suit. 
And it's an eye opener for us men that our wives, our children, our families are watching us to lead. How are we leading them? Are we leading them in the ways of the Lord? Or are we leading them as people that walked in all the sin? We have to be careful, men. And it says in verse 15, they all rejoiced and they all took the oath and sworn with all their heart and sought them with all their soul. I like what it says in verse 16, and he removed Ma'aka, the mother of Asa, the king from being queen mother, for she had made obscene images. We read this already. Asa cut down her obscene image and crushed it and burned it by the book of Kidron. I would have made her eat it too. Here, add this to your pozole, right? <laughs> Again, look at verse 17 here in 2 Chronicles. But the high places were not removed from Israel. What happened? He did great things. He, he did amazing things. Things that we haven't seen since Solomon. And he's doing these things for the Lord. He started well. But there's a turning point here, guys. A turning point here, because when we look at chapter 16, it says in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, so he's been doing well. There's a king of Israel came up against him, his own countryman, Baasha. We read it already in, in 1 Kings. They, they had a war. And we have read this account here a few minutes ago, but I want to point out the details that points out here in 2 Chronicles because Asa does not finish well. Why does he not finish well? Why did Solomon not finish well? Because his heart was turned after other things. Eventually, men, if those things in our lives that, are, that will bring us down are not removed, it's just a matter of time before it catches up to us. Asa did not remove the high places from Israel and it took just, a t just some time for it to catch up to him. Because look what it says here in verse 2 of chapter 16 that ba Baasha is now the king and he's coming up to him. And it says in verse 2, Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house. And who did he send him to? Did he send him to the temple? He sent him to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus. Do you guys catch it here? He says, let there be a Tweety between... A, a Tweety? That's Tweety Bird. <laughs> First of all, the cat. Let there be a Tweety Bird. <laughs> let there be a treaty between you and me. As there was between my father and your father. We've read this already. Verse 4. So Ben-Hadad heeded to the king, and he sent the captains of the armies against the city of Israel. They attacked it. They overtook it. In verse 7, at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, the king, and it says, because, uh, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria, and have not relied on the Lord your God, Therefore, the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army yet with many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them from your hand. Verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And in this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Look what it says here at the end. In verse 12, And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased, and his feet and his melody was severe, yet in his disease he did not seek the Lord, but physicians. Do you guys see what has happened here? Do you see what is obvious here, men? Because I'm going to challenge you. Because if you do not see what's obviously here, if you are unable that if you're unable to see what's going on right here, then I would consider I would really consider and encourage you to read your Bible more. 
I would also encourage you to look at the things in your life where we think it may be going well and have begun to push the counsel of the Lord out of sight. Things are going well. There's a tendency when, I know you guys remember this. Remember when we've been busted? Or we're in a jam? Or in a crisis? We're like, Lord, get me out of this, please. And I promise I'll serve you. And then you walk through them doors. You're like, peace out, Jesus. I don't need you any longer. Sometimes we, when things are going well, we all have a tendency to push God on the side. And then we'll use them like a vitamin when we need to. Take them and then put them back up and then walk along our lives. That is a very dangerous place. Men, if you do not see what is going on here, I would say you need to read your Bibles more. Proverbs chapter 19, verses 19 through 20, it says, Listen to the counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel will stand. There can be times, men, where we think, I'm doing pretty good in my walk. And we begin getting a little bit laxed in a, those things that we have regarded as that could be a high place in our hearts. And we become a little lax and we're like, we don't need to remove that high place right now, that place of thing. We begin to take our eyes off, Lord, and we begin to seek our own ways. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21 says, For all seek their own and not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Asa failed to seek the Lord. He sought the Lord against the Ethiopians, but he did not seek the Lord with Ben-Hadad. He gave away his treasure. Men, when we compromise with the world, when we compromise of the things of the enemy, we will give up the treasures of our hearts. He will rip them off from us. And he thinks that there is a treaty between them when we think we can bargain with the ways of the world, we're getting set up. Somehow, some reason, Asa didn't seek the counsel of the Lord in this war against Baasha, and, and he tried to get a sworn enemy of Israel to come and make a deal with him to undermine his own countrymen. We know, men, that the plan of the enemy never works. Asa started well but he didn't end well. Why? Because he took his eyes off Jesus. <clears throat> what plans may we have in our hearts, men, that are not of Jesus? What are some of those little compromises that we have that we can carry here and there that will eventually became a high place in our hearts? Because if we do have them, men, I would encourage you, strike them down. And if you are, again, I'm going to challenge you, if you're reading this and say, I don't see an issue with this, get in your word more. Because it's clear that Asa went to the ways of the world. He did not remove thoroughly the high places that were in Israel, in Judah. And it came back and bit him in the behind. What are those things that we've been instructed to cut down yet we have not because it's our own secret sin. We've even named it and we tuck it away. Maybe it has nothing to do with the high places or with secret sin. Maybe it's about our obedience to the Lord. I would encourage you guys for us to measure our obedience to the Lord this morning. There's no half be obedience. And I shared with Max at one time, there's no half disobedience either. Men, either we are obedient and we have those high places cut down, or we're not. Men, let's finish well. Let's be men who start well. Some of us will stumble out of the gate, but let's be men that finish well, keeping our eyes on King Jesus so that we will hear at the end, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. That makes sense, you guys? Yes. I got booed off the stage, I think. If you guys enjoyed that, you guys can come leave your offering at my feet. <laughs> yes. I haven't played golf in like two months, you guys. I removed that high place from my heart. It is now a high place that I had to remove. 
At least my wife says so. Andy will be in the back selling the $30 tickets for our men's gathering. Oh, and reminder, I had shared on Sunday that we were going to have our luncheon for the church. Just kidding. We're going to do it November 7th. Uh, and so I just wanted you guys to get hyped up. Uh, but we're going to move it to November 7th. Give us this more time to plan. So the, the, the meal that we're going to have after first and second service this Sunday, we're going to push it out to November 7th. God bless you guys. Thank you guys for joining us online. And uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, of this example of starting well, but not finishing well. Lord, there are times when I even start not well. It doesn't matter. What matters is how we finish. I lift up every man that's here, Lord, that we may be men who race the race with endurance, led by your Holy Spirit. We're so thankful, Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins. And Lord, we're so thankful that you are our finish line who will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Let us continue to learn from these, these kings that were in Israel so many years ago, but the application is so real today. Lord, we do lift up Todd Collins today, Lord, as he's going to have knee surgery. We ask for a quick recovery. We lift up uh, Bill Arianus's family as Bill went home to be with the Lord. We lift up uh, the Reggae family as Edwin has gone home to be with the Lord. One of our brothers here from Tuesday morning went home to be with the Lord and his memorial service is this Friday. We lift up their families, Lord. So Lord, be with us during this time. Be with us during this fellowship. And Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. Thank you guys for watching online. Rick Vasquez, I didn't see you here, Rick. Richard, Brucey. God bless you guys.